My name is Marissa Parham. I'm the director for Five College Digital Humanities. I'm also an associate professor of English here at Amherst College. Um, what you're here with today um, is a speaker series we're putting on for the remainder of the year. And they're all speakers we've invited who are not only concerned with interactions between the human and the machine and the digital, but also thinking about the stakes of those interactions on human expression, creativity, consciousness, and liberty. And this is particularly important for us because very often when people think of digital technologies and think of the relationship between technology and humanities, very often people go immediately to the argument that somehow you're talking about something impersonal. Right? We've expressly invited speakers this year to help us better understand where the human in digital humanities lives and how we think about the ways in which technologies enhance those relationships. These are speakers who are concerned with questions of interactivity, particularly how interactive modes of critical, creative, and scholarly engagement transform our relationships to larger social and political issues and are embedded in the scholarly and artistic endeavors. Our speaker today is Angel Nevis. Professor Nivis is an Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Hamilton College, and he's also the co-director of the Digital Humanities Initiative at Hamilton College. Um, he comes to us also from a doctoral work in architectural history and Africana Studies at Cornell University. And in recent years, his scholarly work and community-based activism have critically engaged with issues of memory, heritage preservation, gender, and nationalism at the intersections of race in the built environment in cities across the global south. You know, I was thinking earlier this year, I was giving a talk in Cape Town, and it was about technology and the human, and thinking about the global south and all these things, and this very sort of patriarchal sort of audience member gets up and he goes, well, people who are poor don't care about technology. People who are poor don't care about the digital, and people don't care about the modern world. And I thought it was a really kind of compelling moment of imagining who gets to make a claim on what matters to whom, right? So I'm particularly interested today in Professor Nava's talk because I think it's a demonstration of why it's critical to think about digital technologies in the life context of people who are otherwise understood, unfairly understood or assumed as uninterested in such things. He's here to talk with us about the building of a multimodal information environment that helps us think about Soweto's past, present, and future redevelopment while addressing cultural practices of remembrance, reconciliation, and empowerment with a view towards an integrative approach to social justice and the practical um, practice of digital humanities scholarship. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nils. Thanks so much. Um, I'm beginning to feel like uh, Amherst is a second home. I think this is my third trip in a matter of handful of months. So thank you for inviting me back. Um, I'm looking forward to this talk. I want to thank Dr. Marissa Parham, Ms. Kimberly Bain, and Mr. Jeffrey Morrow, and the Five College uh, Digital Humanities Steering Committee for putting together such a wonderful speaker series and for inviting me to help take uh, this first step uh, in, in discussing digital humanities. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to do a number of different things in this talk, and you're going to be my guinea pigs in a way for this. Um, I'm going to be talking for the first time about uh, some of the work um, that I've been proposing over the past decade as part of a digital online publication, Apartheid Heritages, A Spatial History of South Africa's Townships. And if any of you know of a publisher that might be interested in this enterprise, I'd, I'd be happy to have conversations with him or her. Um, in 2013, a group of scholars from across the United States approached the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations, or ADHO, with a proposal for a new special interest group, or SIG, with a focus on social justice and human rights. As a step forward, the group developed, quote, an advisory document for building collaborative projects conducting events, gathering sensitive data, and composing scholarly communications with social justice issues and human rights in mind." End of quote. In 2011, the United Nations issued a report that declared internet access a human right. Interestingly, on that same day, two-thirds of Syria's internet access had gone dark, something that was likely the work of the al-Assad regime in response to unrest in that country. 
As part of the initial group of scholars who worked to develop this special interest group, I was much more invested in the potential praxis-based strategies we might develop, perhaps a list of ethical guidelines or even a kind of social justice toolkit for engaging in community-centered digital humanities projects. Some of what I'll be discussing further here today is in itself filled with some controversy and is worthy of further debate with regard to issues of ethics, reality, and truth as applied to historical reconstructions, specifically computer-generated visualizations of historic landscapes and buildings within contested areas in certain fields, as issues of power and representation will not be overlooked. I was reminded when preparing for this talk of Hayden White's essay for a 2005 issue of Rethinking History, his title, Historical Fiction, Fictional History, and Historical Reality, in which he quotes from uh, Ralph Ellison's 1958 essay, Some Questions and Some Answers. There, Ellison writes, men cannot unmake history, quote, thus it is not a question of reincarnating those cultural traditions which were destroyed, but a matter of using industrialization, modern medicine, modern science in general, to work in the interest of these peoples rather than against them." End of quote. In some small ways, I see much of our work, perhaps in an Afrofuturist sense, as taking full advantage of modern science and technology to question our narrative practices in the digital realm. My work, I would argue, also raises questions about the persistence of a digital divide that now exists between the global north and south. Radical change is therefore necessary, I would argue, along the many social, economic, political, regulatory, and infrastructural barriers that continue to disadvantage many of the world's informational peripheries to aid those people who remain invisible or unheard of in, or unheard in the African diaspora. In the field of Africana are black studies, of which much of my work is centered. Scholar Abdul Al-Kalimat, a leader in e-black studies, has made clear that, quote, the impact of the information revolution can lead to a renaissance of community development, cultural creativity, and liberation politics, end of quote. My talk this afternoon explores the building of this multimodal information environment to discuss Soweto's past, present, and future redevelopment, as part of these new series of cultural practices of remembrance, reconciliation, and empowerment with a view towards an integrative approach to social justice and the practice of digital humanities scholarship. I must warn you up front that my digital scholarship to date comprises several works in process and is something that has been several years in the making and has already touched upon several discrete but ultimately interrelated areas of inquiry in apartheid era South Africa. As it stands today, virtual heritage projects require multidisciplinary teams of historians, writers, designers, software developers, cultural heritage managers, and local community informants who would collaborate in the design, development, and management of an immersive 3D virtual heritage landscape. This emerging digital research paradigm is quite unlike that of the archetypal solitary scholar toiling alone in a dusty arc, toiling alone in a dusty archive. In particular, my projects would not be possible without a team of scholars and practitioners from Hamilton College's Digital Humanities Initiative, where I'm currently co-director with Janet Simons. Digital humanities as a field, as a discipline, and a new knowledge community is by its very nature a collaborative and iterative process that cannot be undertaken without a cohort of experts from all sides of learning through making spectrum and doing spectrum that includes librarians, undergraduate student interns, designers, and software engineers. In other words, as a professor and a researcher, I'm in many ways a project manager of a team of expert scholars that I rely upon to tell me this particular, to help me tell this particular spatial narrative. For those of you who may not know about our work at Hamilton, I would be remiss if I did not mention or at least situate myself in an intellectual space, in an intellectual kind of place. DHI is what we call a kind of collaboratory, a kind of humanities lab, where new media and computing technologies are used to promote humanities-based teaching, research, and scholarship across the liberal arts. For me, the liberal arts environment places a strong emphasis on the undergraduate curriculum and the integration of humanities-based research questions into undergraduate scholarship. So in South Africa, the legacy of apartheid has meant a constant engagement with cultural trauma and its impact on all aspects of social life, particularly for township residents beginning in the early 20th century. I've been working on various preservation efforts in Johannesburg's southwestern townships, better known as Soweto, for almost a decade, beginning in 2004. 
Located some 30 kilometers from downtown Johannesburg, the township of Soweto has been a site of both historical contestation and numerous state-sponsored heritage projects. Soweto was also where my first area of digital inquiry and recovery began, at the Hector Peterson Memorial Museum in Johannesburg, a site that preserves the history and memory of all those who were involved in the Soweto Uprising of 16 June 1976. The museum is named in honor of 13-year-old Hector Peterson, among the first student victims to die in the uprisings. On that fateful day, Soweto students gathered to protest against the use of Afrikaans language as a medium of teaching and learning in black schools. Shortly thereafter, police began shooting at the assembled marchers, violently disrupting what was to be a peaceful protest. Hector Peterson's death and the subsequent killing of 575 other protesters in the uprisings that would help bring about the first uh, democratic election in 1994 are memorialized at this National Heritage Site. And I would also add that um, that number of 575 is, is a, a, a low number and the statistics actually on how many people died as a result of the uprisings is, is one of the historical kind of questions that we have about this particular period, and I can talk more about that. So the first South African research project, eventually entitled um, Soweto 76, had a scope that provided for the digitization and preservation of the archival collections of the Hector Peterson Museum with the intention of providing online access to its holdings for broad public use. The holdings were considered endangered due to a lack of available resources for their care and preservation. The project was initially proposed to convert some 20 audio cassette tapes of interviews conducted with students involved in the uprisings of 1976 into digital format. Now, even after years of working on community-based projects, I somewhat foolishly thought I could digitize the audio cassette tapes at the Hector Peterson Museum over the course of six months while also developing a front-end interface for accessing the interviews online. I was naive to say the least, and for those of us who know about this kind of work, um, that's still a project that's in process, given the kinds of interventions that we've been trying to work through with community-based, this kind of community-based archiving. Um, so between 2006 and 2007, while at the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, the project team began the process of digitizing a broader selection of their multimedia collections and holdings. As cultural studies scholar Chela Sandoval argued in her book, Methodology of the Oppressed, the world inhabited by wired, technologized, privileged subjects requires a shift in educational preparation and cultural expertise so that, quote, the technologies developed by and with subjugated populations to negotiate this realm of shifting meanings can prove indispensable, end of quote. So part of what I try to do is place various technologies in the hands of subjugated populations, which I would argue allows for a new kind of engagement to occur. The rise in network technologies, or what we call Web 2.0, has now allowed a diverse group of users to actively express and interrogate their racial, gendered, national, and class identities. We have seen the power of the internet to transform the political, social, and economic future of a nation. For example, here in the US with Obama's first election, or with the many Arab Springs that have occurred across the Middle East over the past handful of years, and within countries across the African continent, Liberia, Rwanda, and South Africa, to name a few. In my own work with township residents in Soweto, I've witnessed the emancipatory potential of the internet and the new digital technologies for disclosing as yet untold stories about the anti-apartheid movement, which not only impacts South Africans, but which is a worldwide movement in and of itself, wasn't it a worldwide movement in and of itself? In South Africa, those post-apartheid identities have largely been mediated through what Deborah Polzel sees as, quote, the avowedly normative, officializing project of the Truth Commission, or the TRC, end of quote. The various projects I've been involved with in South Africa were largely developed to address the failures of the TRC of the mid-1990s to adequately address the role of women in the struggle against apartheid, particularly those women and their historical agency about whom we as outsiders to that story know so little. A common thread throughout much of this work has been a focus on the experiences of women across the African diaspora who have not only struggled against the forces of the state and nation, but have also sought innovative ways to tell their stories and provide the testimony needed to begin the process of historical recovery, rebuilding, and reconciliation. I want to relate the story of one woman, 
a woman whose story was referred to me by the then director of the Hector Peterson Museum and who was detained because of the General Law Amendment Act of 1963, which, quote, authorized any commissioned officer of the South African government to detain without a warrant any person suspected of political activities and to hold them without access to a lawyer for 90 days, end of quote. So on April 30th, 1996, before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a representative of the commission read the following. June 16, 1976 saw the outbreak of violence on a larger scale than has ever been experienced in South Africa. During this time, police were engaged in countrywide arrests. Both adults and children were arrested. Quite a number of children went missing, and most of them were not being held by police, but had gone into hiding following the house-to-house -house raids. It was during this time that Pauline Mohale got arrested and suffered all kinds of human rights violations. End of quote. In her own words, Pauline recounts the events that led to her arrest. And I apologize for the length of what I'm about to read, but I think it's important to contextualize her narrative, and then we're going to listen to some testimony that I gathered um, in working with her. So before the TRC, she said, in 1976, I wasn't working. I was a member of SCM, Student Christian Movement. I was working with the students that's during the time we were fighting the Afrikaans issue and their equal rights as far as education was concerned. We marched in 1976. We used to march to John Foster Square, police, has, where police headquarters is in downtown Johannesburg. When we arrived at New Canada, which is a site nearby the police headquarters, they started throwing tear gas at us. Some of our friends died there and others were arrested. But the day I managed to escape, I wasn't arrested. Some of them were being looking after by friends, but I was traveling to Swaziland. I was helping the other children to escape the country. They used to sleep under the table and throughout, and then we used to take a combi or truck so that they could go to Swaziland to get further training in Swaziland. They wanted to cross the border of Swaziland, but on that it happened that when we left, it was on the 16th, the day of the uprising, but I was also booked to go because I realized it was beginning to hot up. And this phrase, hot up, means that things were getting very tense um, in the townships on um, these particular days. When we arrived at the border gate, before we arrived, um, there was a roadblock. We just saw a huge light, and they stopped the driver. They told us, we know that you are going to cross the border. You are going to get military training so that you can come back and start killing white people. We said no, we were lost. They arrested us, and they put us in a cell in a prison near the border gate. I was the only girl among them. The rest were the boys. So they closed me separately from that group. The following day, the police came in a truck. They came from Krugersdorp to fetch us. They were from the special branch." End of quote. I'm going to play now a, a, a clip. Uh, I got to know Pauline uh, a couple of years ago, um, and she spends a little bit of time with me um, talking about her incarceration. Um, and here she's going to talk a little bit about um, her almost two-year period in which she was tortured by the SA police, South African police, to reveal information about student protesters and activists. In this short clip, she describes one way that female guards attempted to break her by putting something inside a bag in her jail cell. The case continued during the case, during the trial, it was just chaotic. Even in the cell, they would throw things in my cell. Sometimes I'll just, when I came back from court, I'll just see a rat coming out of the cell, not knowing how it got in there, hmm. but it went out. One night, when I was in the cell, I used to have a small paper bag in the corner and a bucket which I used to, re to release myself. Mm. One day I had this funny noise in, the, in, the, in that paper bag which I was carrying my clothes. You know, if you can see the prison, even the... I can say the cockroach cannot even go through that mm. that hole, that, that 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 those fences which the butler proving that they've made, mm. and the windows are so high. Mm. But I was surprised when I see that I, when I had 
a noise in my in in my paper bag. I started asking myself, what was, what is going on there? Mm. But I said to myself, he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. Mm. Please help me, my Lord. I'm going to face that thing which is in my paper bag. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to. It, I'm not going to allow it to come to me. I am going to it now. I'm challenging it. Mm. I took my shoe. Mm. I hold it like this. I dropped the paper bag down. I took my clothes one by one. One by one. Then I saw this thing. You know the the wing, the the whisk, the. It was doing like this. The whiskers. Then I, I asked myself, what is this? I don't know what, what it was. It was a big thing like this. Mm. A brown one, like a cro cockroach. Something from the bushes, some, like mm. in the mountains, I don't know what it was. Then I said, my Lord, help, give me strength. I'm going to get the head of this thing mm. and chop it up. They took my shoe and then took one of them. When I took one, two, three, four, five, that thing was dead. I took a newspaper, I folded it, I threw it in my bucket. Then I said, these people put this thing in here, and I'm, they, they're trying to get into me, and they're not going to get me. Mm -hmm. I put it in my paper bag. I, I, I mean, I put it in the, in the bucket. Mm -hmm. In the morning, when every morning they would open the door to take me to shower. It will be only one prison murder. But that day there were three. They wanted to maybe to, to find out what happened mm. overnight. Mm. Whether I ate that thing or what <laughs> happened to it. <laughs> I took the bucket, threw it in the toilet, I bathed, came back, I looked at them in their eyes. They looked at me also. They looked at each other. So I think the power of this kind of testimony, um, that she's able to actually laugh um, after so many years uh, about this kind of incident. And, and this was just a very small example of the kind of torture that she was subjected to over the course of almost two years. Um, and, and what always strikes me about the testimony is her faith that things were going to get better. I mean, it comes through in, in her testimony. And so this is just a small clip of, of lots of different kinds of conversations we had. Um, interestingly, I think if we think about black feminist scholarship during the past 30 years or so, I would argue that it has made so many of us more conscious of the importance of letting women speak about their experiences as a legitimate way of questioning dominant paradigms of knowing and perhaps even unknowing. The popularity of oral histories on the web in recent years reflects an attempt to capture the voices of immediate experiences. But as it's been pointed out, many of these so-called voices are mediated, edited, translated, corrected by intellectuals working the academy, or even in libraries and repositories already strapped for resources. One of the things when I, whenever I play other clips, um, you sort of hear me do the old school black thing where we go, mm. Mm, when someone is talking, um, I don't know, y'all know this, but that's what we do. Um, and I have been criticized for keeping that in uh, the actual audio tape. Um, and we've had quite a contestation over that. And part of me saying, I'm acknowledging what she's saying, and she is responding to that. And if I remove that, that's in many ways sort of extracting the authenticity of that kind of an account. So it, it always makes me laugh whenever I sort of hear myself going, mm -mm. I figure, <laughs> wow, I must do that at all lectures and talks. Um, so as seen across South Africa, the resources needed to preserve intangible heritage and even extant cultural heritage, artifacts, buildings, material objects, et cetera, remain out of reach for a whole host of reasons. And I'm more than happy to talk about some of those. And, and some of these will become uh, quite evident. 
Few studies have really considered the historical significance of these townships, townships that the disenfranchised, such as Paulina Mohali, called home, as extant physical artifacts of a difficult past. However, they now face complex heritage issues and the concurrent pressures of the international tourist market. The image here is actually an image um, that was put together by a kind of propaganda campaign to suggest that living in the townships was actually the design of the Garden City movement of the 19-teens and 20s. I don't know how many of you know about the Garden City movement. Perhaps some of you even live in a Garden City or live in a Garden City type community. But this was essentially a propaganda photo. Not, none of Soweto looked like this. I'll show you some other images. This was completely staged as part of this propaganda campaign to really talk about, look at what we're doing with the native. Look at what we're doing with the Bantu. We are giving them civilization. Look at the fences. Look at the vegetation. Look at the girls with the hats. All of this was really a part of this propaganda machine of the apartheid government. Um, so if we think about the kind of pressures that a place like Soweto encounters now because of tourism, I, I guess I have to ask, do the meaning and significance as sites of trauma, resistance, and empowerment for residents of these planned communities defer to the competing interests of urban redevelopment, large-scale heritage planning, and globalization? So a blog post sent to me by a Hamilton colleague reminded me that much of the work I've been engaged in is what the Lesbian History Archives calls radical archiving. But in many ways, those of us working at the intersections of archive making, virtual environment development, and historical reconstructions have grappled with a series of complex social justice issues while working within communities that have been adversely impacted by the work of architects and planners in service of the state. I wholeheartedly throw myself in there as trained as an architect myself. I'm very cognizant of the ways in which architecture can be manipulated by the state to kind of do the things and the bidding of the state. Apartheid planning and architecture were the direct results of serious human rights violations perpetuated by a state that was based entirely on racial violence against anyone other than those labeled white and European. In South Africa, growing concern over the preservation of documents related to the liberation struggle of the 1970s against apartheid has spurred new theoretical, methodological, and even pedagogical questions over the making of web-based archives for local community-based township museums. Much of the work I've been involved with, and, and I'm doing a big sort of lead up, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a big reveal. So it's important to sort of lay out sort of, you know, all these elements of what I'm trying to argue. And then I'll I, I, work with me. I'm getting you to the big reveal. Um, I see the potential out of an African digital history to interrogate the conditions of life histories of human rights violations by examining these conditions for their emancipatory potential and their capacity for instituting dialogical forms of historical consciousness between the testimony donors and the possible communities of witness on the internet. In other words, can those stories about life under apartheid actually affect change among their viewership on the internet? Can radical archives, archiving, making, act as a form of advocacy alongside efforts to promote a form of restorative social justice? Can historical reconstructions, virtual environments provide opportunities for reconciliation, new forms of truth-telling and archive-making in countries ravaged by colonial empire-building? I would argue that this is possible, although filled with its share of much-needed interrogation. I would also argue that the link between human rights and the preservation of cultural heritage resources, particularly those in the built environment, is often misunderstood. If we are truly seeking social justice, we must remember these historical injustices and recognize how they continue to shape identities even today. It is therefore essential to understand cultural heritage resources as part of a people's efforts to maintain and construct their own identity within a reconciliation process. Historic sites are critical elements in the struggle for equality and democracy, and new technologies can be used to increase access to the information kept in these important spaces. For example, the work of my colleague Edward Gonzalez Tennant, assistant professor at Monmouth University in New Jersey, provides an example of efforts, quote, to utilize new media to open digital spaces, thus encouraging candid reflection on the connections between historical, face-to-face -face violence, and present inequality. 
For those of you who may not know the story of Rosewood, Florida in 1923, essentially this entire community was leveled, um, all on the base of a false accusation um, of uh, a, a man making overtures to a white woman. That was an African American gentleman making overtures to a white woman. And this is just one of the hundreds of lynchings and campaigns that erased communities across the United States. And my colleague has been working to develop a kind of GIS to provide a contextualization uh, of this history. Um, in much the same way that my team and I are trying to work to employ GIS in, in, and to assist in succeeding phases of the South African research that we've been working on. And here you're beginning to see some of his work um, to sort of grapple with the erasure of this kind of landscape and to bring that back online. So I would argue that the new digital, techno new digital technologies can also help to challenge the way one interprets and uses forms of historical evidence and testimony concerning the legacy of apartheid. In particular, digital technologies can work to fill in those many absences in the historical record, particularly as they relate to everyday citizens and their roles in social movements across the global south. Okay, now, now, now I'm giving it to you, okay? Um, the development cycle of Soweto 76, and particularly its follow-up, Soweto 76 3D, the 3D recreation and simulation component of the overall project, was an ambitious technological goal when we first took it up in 2007. Now, for most people in the room, I hope you all were born um, or might even remember 2007. I remember the 70s, but that's another show. Um, although we had sufficient tools to create a sample 3D model of Soweto, the goal at the time was ultimately to let our users explore in real time without feeling limited by their operating system or web browser and without having to download and install a desktop program simply to access what was ultimately a web-based archive. Technological obstacles in 2007, which are a bit too complex and perhaps a little too nerdy to sort of get into here, led to an intermediate solution to create a kind of proof of concept demo illustrating the environment we aim to create. Um, you begin to sort of get a sense of the possibilities of creating this kind of space. And I wanted to show a little bit of this sort of creation, recreation that we began back in 2007 because this really wasn't something that was easy to do. Uh, so basically we ended up using Google's SketchUp own animation support to create kind of fly-throughs. We rendered both models and transition videos to create a kind of on-the-rails 3D interactive environment that we could deliver through the widely available and well-supported Flash. Um, and those of us who don't remember what Flash is. It's a type of animation software that has gone the way of the dodo bird. So Flash has long been gone. Um, so we were immediately satisfied with the result, but more so with the ability it gave us to demonstrate and describe our intended feature set to our audience and potential project partners. But of course, this approach was ultimately limited in its extensibility and required a great deal of hands-on work to add new content. Given the extensive work the project required in other areas of its technical infrastructure, particularly the mon monumental task of assembling and implementing the database of locations, assets, and relationships between and among them, the decision was made to focus on these technology developments while waiting for the development efforts of various WebGL projects for showing interactive 3D graphics to sort of catch up to the standard web browsers such as Firefox or Chrome. So we weren't essentially able to embed these 3D worlds in web browsers back in 2007. So happily today, some six to seven years later, um, and, and another part of the story that I don't tell is that um, the Atlantic Philanthropies was about to sign an $800,000 check to me and to Myth and to our community partners to work on this. This was 2008. What happened in 2008? The market crashed and Atlantic Philanthropies had to essentially funnel all of its resources to help NGOs uh, get the kind of infrastructure that they needed because the bottom fell out of the market. So this project that we all worked on for a couple of years to get going didn't go anywhere because of the crash. So, but in some ways I think it's a good thing. You have to sort of look at these things as good things. So ultimately what we came up with and what we are moving towards is something that looks a lot more like this. 
The Soweto Historical GIS Project's genesis began three years ago when I began a collaborative research project with three students in the Department of Geography at Middlebury College, along with Professor Ann Knowles, to build a historical GIS database drawn from a collection of 38 largely unseen maps, architectural plans, and drawings that were recovered by, by me and my researchers from the National Archives Repository in Pretoria. These 38 maps, architectural plans, and drawings are were from the apartheid era public works department and and some of what I'm trying to also reveal here is that again this is not a lone enterprise there are lots of people working on this so the documents developed by architects engineers and city planners and dating for the period of the 1890s to the 1950s and 60s provide unique insights into the design and construction of model township communities for the city of Johannesburg during the apartheid era that these existing idealized township designs were never realized in mass for a variety of political, social, and economic factors is a topic that no researcher has yet to fully investigate in the fields of historical GIS or historical geography. And literally, we would have never uncovered this had it not been for the work of an archivist who happened to say to me, you know, there's this stack of plans and architectural drawings from the townships that nobody's ever looked at. They've been here for years, and I wondered if you'd have any interest in them. <laughs> well, I had a lot of interest in them. And so we actually uh, paid to have them all digitized for the National Archives and began working with them. And that project really began to consider the following. How were apartheid policies constructed in the Soweto landscape? Our early findings demonstrate and chronicle how a research question can inspire methodology for historical GIS through collaboration across disciplines and knowledge communities by working with undergraduate research assistants as collaborators. However, the study is different from most previous scholarship on the history of South Africa's all-black townships because few of any of these sources have been available to a wider public until now. Um, I guess in some ways I'm, I'm also sort of talking about the ways in which other projects have emerged that deal with similar issues. A project I, I didn't show here is Virtual Williamsburg. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Colonial Williamsburg's project, but that is also something that sort of begins to make certain kinds of arguments about Colonial Williamsburg. Um, and that too runs on this Unity game uh, engine, and uh, it, 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 it's quite a fascinating uh, uh, intervention. I think it has some issues if we're going to think about race in a critical kind of way and think about people populating these spaces and, and perhaps I have a solution for some of that. So this historical GIS project really thought to build a kind of multi-layered historical geographic information system database that explores the social, economic, and political dimensions of urban development under South African apartheid. And here's an image of actually what Soweto looked like. If I was to put that up against that propaganda photo, I think you're going to see some vast differences in what these kinds of landscapes look like. Um, and, and what also has been very revealing, um, it's not a joke, but um, um, dictatorships are really good at documenting themselves. I don't know if anyone's noticed this. Um, it's part of their machinery. Um, and one of the things that the apartheid government was particularly good at was surveillance. And they were particularly good at surveilling the townships. So I also happened to come across aerial photographs that the apartheid government was taking at very high resolution from the early 1930s through the 1970s and 80s of the townships. And this has been very helpful to see the growth and development and change over time in how the, the, the townships grew. And what I'm essentially trying to argue here is that we're really looking at a way in which we might write a spatial history of a kind of traumascape. And spatial history and, and traumascape are some of the terms and terminology that those of us working in historical reconstruction have been dealing with. Um, for those of you who may know, Stanford has a whole spatial history uh, arm to some of their work, and it's worth sort of looking at, at there. They have a whole lab devoted to spatial history. 
So building a virtual heritage suite of tools and accompanying research methodologies for the purpose of designing and developing and displaying authentic virtual heritage knowledge in a geospatially accurate environment is not by any means a simple task, especially when working so closely with community stakeholders who want to see this work used and implemented further locally. Questions about the efficacy of developing platforms and digital archives in communities of color in the global south cannot be ignored and need to be further explored through a collaborative process with community stakeholders. Staff from the Hector Peterson Museum and members of the Soweto 76 Foundation, former students who took part in the liberation struggle, and also local community-based scholars have all participated in various ways over the years. This is admittedly a somewhat haphazard process given the many intra and inter-community struggles that often mirror the changes in local and national government leadership. The use of virtual heritage applications in museums and cultural institutions is becoming more and more commonplace and is used as a vehicle for attracting younger visitors or digital natives. Sites of difficult heritage across the US and Europe have been able to take advantage of the recent proliferation and affordability of digital scanning devices to provide virtual and physical replication of objects or entire landscapes po made possible. Um, one such case is the State Museum of Auschwitz-Birkenau offers a virtual tour of Auschwitz through QuickTime virtual reality clips and unfortunately again through flash panoramas because so much of the site fails to look anything as it did during the Allied bombing campaigns. Since 2012, a group of German architects and Israeli historians has been working to produce a 3D computer sort of based uh, visualization of from detailed blueprints and architectural plans of each of the hundreds of structures located in the three central parts of the camp. However, with recreations such as these also comes controversy. Historical geographer Tim Cole has labeled much of the visitor experience at Auschwitz-Birkenau as Auschwitzland, a Holocaust theme park, rather than a Holocaust concentration camp. Cole writes, walking through Auschwitzland, we do not see an authentic past preserved carefully for the present. We don't experience the past as it really was, but experience a mediated past which has been carefully created for our viewing. For some, acts, for some, acts of reconstructing sites of tragedy and establishing memorial landscapes only contribute to historical inauthenticity, trivialization, and a kind of ex commercial exploitation of death and violence. Much of those same criticisms could be lobbied at the memorial practices of a white majority heritage industry across South Africa that has carefully scripted the fight to end apartheid as a narrative of good versus evil. Many of those narratives depict the African National Congress, or ANC, as a multiracial social movement that did not, in and of itself, similarly perpetuate systems of oppression, much like the white minority-led nationalist party, particularly along gender lines. Instead, the ANC continues to foster a kind of national narrative, largely resulting from the proceedings of the televised Truth and Reconciliation Commission of a miraculous moral story. Institutions such as the Apartheid Museum, the District 6 Museum, the Robben Island Museum, and Freedom Park, all resulting from the ANC's 1996 legacy project, were built to challenge colonial museum narratives and provide new forms for formerly marginalized voices to emerge. These newer institutions and many others built across South Africa's many townships, including those in Soweto, played a major role in advancing forms of reconciliation and helped to formulate a shared national identity for collectively dismantling apartheid. However, for some township residents, these museums and national memorial sites only further compounded the inaccuracies and distorted the everyday realities of how apartheid was lived day to day. Unfortunately, accounts by women such as the aforementioned Pauline Mohali remain at the margins. Even Hector Peterson's narrative of martyrdom, although featured prominently at the museum named in his honor, does not, however, tell a full account of the events of that day. What is often overlooked is that site marked by the city of Johannesburg as the location of where Hector was actually shot by police is not where that violation of basic human rights occurred. Here I'm showing uh, some visualizations we've developed to try to give you a sense of what um, I'm talking about. What's interesting here is that uh, Antoinette, who was actually Hector's sister, uh, has a very different remembrance, memory, of that particular day and what happened. She claims that Hector was shot and fell where our A is on the slide. Now, an older gentleman who actually lived in the neighborhood suggests that 
Hector fell on the other side of the street. Now, the city of Johannesburg marked Site C as the memorial location of where he was shot. And part of why the city picked this particular spot, if you see Villacazzi Street is sort of the famed street where many Nobel laureates, um, Mandela and Desmond Tutu lived, but the reason the city of Johannesburg picked this site was because it was easier for buses to drive along Villacazzi Street. So they recrafted the narrative to sort of fit the tourist pressure of getting buses in and out of Soweto. But what's more important here is that the memory of where it actually happened is contested, right? Yeah. Is in question. So I would argue that a 3D reconstruction of the events of that day, something that could conceivably emerge from our ongoing efforts at Hamilton's DHI, could provide unique insights into what occurred and perhaps even act as a reform of restorative social justice. If all of these conflicting accounts were told through a spatial history process that allowed for digital testimony and also digital witnessing to occur. So I've been showing you images of sort of the next generation of our 3D development of Soweto. And you're beginning to see again, this is not a lone enterprise. Um, this is part of what my team has been developing. And these are very early schematics that we're starting to sort of work with because of the Unity game engine that has become popularized as a kind of research tool. And here you're beginning to see some of the ways in which that's happened. Um, that's probably somewhat controversial. Now I'm going to get into perhaps the more controversial part of my discussion. Most recently, colleagues from five different institutions and I were awarded just this past year a National Endowment for the Humanities uh, grant for this project entitled Dangerous Embodiments, Theories, Methods, and Best Practices for Historical Character Modeling in Humanities 3D Environments. We're working towards the development of a comprehensive typology for avatar creation, an essential, new, and potentially valuable contribution to the field and the deployment of different possible representative avatars in two virtual difficult heritage environments. One being Soweto, and you're seeing some of the early work uh, that we've done to sort of develop these characters. And the other is actually um, the last extant slave uh, plantation called Lakeport Plantation in Arkansas. So we're working in these two highly contested spaces to begin to think about the ways in which one might represent historical figures. We intend to study viewer responses to different representative avatars within these environments using tools drawn from experimental philosophy and to publish the results with interpretation by scholars and diverse array of fields. So despite the abundance of 3D virtual environments for historic sites that have emerged over the past decade, the impact of historical character modeling in the digital humanities has really received little scholarly attention. I think some of my colleagues in uh, archaeology would also say that some of that work has been also very neglected because we sort of fetishize the actual places that we're trying to rebuild and sort of almost do a throwaway when it comes to thinking about character creation and how our characters are made. So some of this work is going to begin to really push on that. And we've got a great team of scholars from around the country coming together. Instead, when character are used in virtual environments, the emphasis is often tends to be on the space, with less attention paid to the modeling of the characters themselves, and how these virtual embodiments impact the viewer or the player. While this lapse may be due in part to a lag in the technology, avatars now have the potential to become increasingly realistic. And I've shown you some images, um, some early images, um, actually done over a year ago by um, a graduate student that I've been working with, and you're beginning to see some of that early work. And in some ways, it almost doesn't look very realistic, right? It sort of looks a little bit uh, playish in a way. Right. And what you're beginning to see then, um, and this was a development that just occurred in the past few days, is a very different character model all of a sudden. Um, she's advanced the work in such a way that we're beginning to see some real kind of facial expression, some kind of humanness to the characters, right? But what we need to do is sort of interrogate this. This is not without controversy. This is fraught with lots and lots of issues. And this is a composite of different women that she sort of developed. Um, perhaps the most uh, telling image, in fact, 
is this one. Uh, with the right kind of lighting and the right kind of look, it's suggestive of the ways in which perhaps we can begin to think about characters being developed for these historical environments. So what I think I'm going to do is fast forward a bit here and sort of in closing, as 3D environments pr proliferate, the creation of a comprehensive typology for avatars and publication of the consequences of certain choices that we make when creating avatars in the environments is really needed. So the preamble to the London Charter for the Computer-Based vi Visualization of Cultural Heritage, which came out in 2006, notes, quote, that a set of principles is needed that will ensure that digital heritage visualization is and is seen to be at least as intellectually and technically rigorous as longer established cultural heritage research and communication methods, end of quote. And yet, the London Charter does not make mention of characters or avatars. Why is this an important issue for the humanist, you might ask? Delivering high-quality 3D content in an interactive way via the web was practically impossible a few years ago. And now, new software really helps to facilitate the next level of imagery and immersion, including these programs such as Unity, and I've begun to show you some of the images of that work, used to increasingly, in the humanities, deliver this 3D content. And really, the need for a study of the impact of avatars on the viewer within the virtual environment, along with the kind of ethical implications of the avatar creation is needed, something with which we are eagerly hoping to engage as part of our NEH grant. And as part of sort of the mission of restorative justice research that we've been developing at Hamilton over the past several years. What we are also now beginning to get into is actually some of the VR work. Um, so we're really looking at the deployment of what does it mean to then be embodied in the actual space. And, and some of that work is early and this will give you sort of a sense of what is possible and we've only just started playing with this, playing kind of making it try to happen in a way that is suggestive of what the many possibilities. If we were to sort of use this kind of technology, what might we be able to do? This is sort of giving you a sense of what you're going to see through the sort of the headgear that you wear for the Oculus Rift. Um, and it's very, very suggestive of lots and lots of ways in which perhaps this level of embodiment might take us into new avenues. Um, I don't have a, a grand conclusion I'm more saying this is a work in progress um, of many, many years and many, many people, um, both here in the US and in South Africa. And I thank you. Thank you very much, Angel. I think now let's take some time. That was very rich. And I think we should take a few moments for questions. Um, and to think about this, oh God, there's a lot to think about. <laughs> Man. And it's interesting too, even just thinking about sort of the images of people being modeled as sort of haunting quality of what it means to reconstruct mm -hmm. and just, but um, we're a really diverse audience here, I think coming from a lot of places and so identify yourselves and let's just start thinking together. I don't think you need even a big fancy question, just how do we talk about this? Please. Sorry, point. <laughs> um, thinking of like um, contested histories yeah. and like um, virtual, you know, variations of like spaces. Um, when you start talking about yeah. immediately out of those work, right? Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, have you like come up with like people who have like contested the issue of what you're doing, like? Mm -hmm. And so I know that like people were kind of against it in South Africa, mm -hmm. and, like mm -hmm. you know, people know the past, but leave it in the past. Um, there's a huge spectrum of responses to the work. Early in, back in 2007, um, the responses were pretty hectic, as we say in South Africa. Um, people were pretty incensed by it because um, first, it was a question of resources. Why are we spending these kinds of resources, this kind of manpower to do this kind of work? Um, and I think it was also a question of who is doing it and who gets to take ownership of it. Um, and we, over the past seven or eight years, have really fought to work with cultural institutions to begin to develop training programs um, and 
Right now, I'm in the midst of trying to create a program with the Steve Biko Foundation to actually train township uh, residents, uh, basically high school students, in skills development to begin to sort of get them to use some of these technologies. So we're working towards that. That's, that's always been the ultimate goal. Um, but I think lots of questions come up um, around infrastructure. You know, in South Africa, they have a different bandwidth than we do. So being able to deploy these kinds of environments when your bandwidth is not quite as robust as it is here in the US raises a whole other litany of questions, right? Let alone accessibility to a computer. One of the things that is overlooked, and, and a colleague and I, Marla Jacks, out of the College of New Jersey, are about to uh, release a, a special issue of the Journal of uh, Interactive Technology and Pedagogy that we just edited that looks at some of these issues on the African continent in terms of how do we sort of think about the deploying of technologies. And there's some really interesting work around cell phone use. One of the things we've really thought is how can we use cell phones because cell phone technology um, in Africa and in Europe is way ahead of us. I mean, way ahead of us. So how can we actually use cell phone technology to begin to get some of these narratives, right? To actually use devices that people are very comfortable with and have those be the kind of gateway into some of this work. Again, it's fraught with lots of issues, um, a resource question comes up, um, but in some ways working with community has revealed to me and to my team that it's really, really important to always check back with the community and to find out what they want. Um, and I've always felt that this really isn't my work. Um, I've always felt in a way that I'm a partial shepherd. Um, we want to transfer all of this work over to institutions there. Um, but there is an infrastructure question. I mean, we have infrastructure questions here in the US, right? Um, when you sort of look at some of the, and my reasons for sort of giving you a little bit of the TRC sort of feel, um, some of the testimony there is, you know, that testimony is actually getting lost. I don't know if you all know this, but it's basically um, being housed in the National Archives and no one has access to it. They've put up um, portions of transcripts and portions of some audio, but um, there's been almost a process of erasure around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because there's a lot of deep-seated issues that were not discussed in the TRC process. And there's a yearning among cultural institutions to find other ways to do that. Um, these are just small attempts to try to say, here's one way to do it, here's another way to do it. Um, what is the best way to do it? You know, I, I, I struggle with that. Um, but again, it's about going back to the community and sort of saying, what do you want? Luckily, I've been fortunate to work with the Soweto 76 Foundation, which is a group of students from the uprising who you know, want to tell the story and know that the internet is that vehicle, right? Because they want to transform the whole museum industry that exists, the whole heritage industry that exists, and essentially has a chokehold by a kind of white minority of scholars and historians who want to tell the story in a particular way. And quite frankly, there are about five PhDs in South Africa who are black South Africans who could ostensibly do this kind of work. I mean, I can count them on both hands. So it begins to be a question of, what are we also doing to, to, to work in institutions of higher education to try to transform the kinds of work that they're doing? You know, to bring different people to the table to have a discussion about these kinds of issues. So it's, it's a pretty complicated uh, story. Great question. Um, I'm, I'm wondering why you chose to do um, Soweto opposed to like erased sites like um, Sophia Town or District 6. Mm -hmm. And also problems around kind of re-entrenching a national narrative by focusing on Soweto because mm -hmm. there are so many other histories and 1976 is, you know, it's, it's not an exceptional um, it is exceptional, but it's also part of a wider picture and a wider context. So I'm just wondering how you build in those kind of complexities and the mm -hmm. historical context into a project like this. And also, how do you have like an embodied experience of an area which is so rich as 
of noises, of sounds, of smells. Um, mm -hmm. Like that, that a lot of South African um, township spaces are. How do you capture that in this kind of format, if you can at all? Luckily, the technology is at a place where we can capture most of that. Smell is actually an area that has, is emerging, uh, interestingly enough, um, in the technology. Um, I don't do that work necessarily, but soundscapes is a huge area. And actually, one of the projects that we work on um, at DHI um, is from a colleague of mine, Kyoko Mori, and this is my back way of sort of talking about sound, is she's been working on uh, the history of benshi performance in uh, Japan, which were essentially narrators who would stand in front of uh, uh, silent movies and sort of narrate them for the public. And they became performance artists in the 20s and 30s. And part of that work, we've actually started to create these 3D environments and recreate the telling of those, those narratives in these spaces. So it's quite possible to actually capture a lot of sound and make that a part of the experience. Um, so, so it's definitely something, um, I mean, there is that fine line between authenticity and that fine line between what is the point of what we're doing and is it going to advance a social justice mission? I mean, the example I tried to show here was finding out exactly where Hector fell is not a small point. It's actually a very important point because it would change the way in which we understand what happened that day and who perpetrated what. Because the national narrative remains one, highly contested, and for all intents and purposes, all of the disappeared students that were never reclaimed by their families because they were lost and arrested and never seen again is really important to get at. And maybe this is one way to start to do some of that work, right? get at that, some of that narrative. Soweto is um, in part problematic, but also it has a rich archival history and a rich archive that exists. So part of the equation was there's enough material out there to get this, to sort of do this work and begin this work, and largely because the community organizations that I started to sort of talk with were willing to sort of partner on this. Um, we've talked to folks at District 6. District 6 actually has some other issues that are coming up. Um, it's about to close its doors um, because it doesn't have the funding that it needs. So there begins to be other kinds of issues that come you know, to bear here when cultural institutions as transformative as District 6 has been are about to close. So there's an archival crisis in South Africa on many different kinds of levels. I mean, finding a way to sort of begin to do interventions has been tough. And um, I would say that the global north and global south divide um, is one that we have to really work to break down and to really try to empower the global south to do this kind of interesting work that's there, that can exist, that can thrive, that can help to build community. So how do we see ourselves as facilitators is really one of the bigger questions that I have, um, because for all of us, it's not about me telling this story. What does the community want, and how do they want to tell it? And this is just one small way that they've wanted to tell it. But there are many other disappeared communities. And, and part of what Soweto can do is be a gateway. Actually, what's been interesting about the work in Soweto is that we're now working with um, mining communities um, to actually try to recover the history of mining compounds because mining compounds in South Africa are actually disappearing. Um, that cultural heritage is being erased, and those are the very foundation of what apartheid was built upon. And if those sites are disappearing, many mining companies are hoping that these mining compounds that basically held these black workers will just fall into the pit of the mine and disappear. And what we've also found is that many of the mining companies have dumped all of their archives. And so there are literally, as a gentleman that I know, who saved information, these death record books, because what the mines don't want us to know, what De Beers doesn't want us to know, what the diamond industry doesn't want us to know is how many deaths occur as a result of the mining that they do. And part of that would mean that the country actually has to invest 
in wanting to preserve some of these sites and some of these places. And for whatever reason, it's not financially workable for them because the very core of the South African sort of infrastructure is built around mining. And if we start to actually recount the many, many deaths and how those things occurred in the mines, it's going to change just our whole understanding of that entire system. So this was really just a gateway to try to begin to tell other stories. And we're starting to try to reach out to do that in different ways. Um, but yes, it's a great question. There are so many other communities that are, there are so many colored communities that were erased that need to have their stories told. Um, if, if, if you want to work on some of this, we should talk. <laughs> Part of what we're hoping um, to do, and, and, and a trauma scape really is, is a place in which some um, difficult moment, some difficult history has occurred, is a place where some tragedy has occurred, and through the virtual environment recreation, what we're hoping to do is actually embed, and some of the images I was trying to show is embed primary documents and narratives and oral histories in that 3D world so you can begin to sort of engage with it as you walk through the environment. So you would be able to click uh, an audio file. You would be able to click a video file. You would be able to see some of the actual documents from the black consciousness movement from the students who lived in Soweto. So that begins to change sort of how you experience that 3D world and mediates a little bit the kinds of questions over authenticity versus what is the story and the narrative that the space is telling us. So it's a hope to sort of bring together both the primary evidence that's there with this kind of recreated space. Because in many instances, some of these recreated spaces are lost, in fact. And so recreating some of that helps to sort of bring that to life. Because there's a whole generation, the born free generation in South Africa, that know absolutely nothing about apartheid and don't want to know anything about apartheid, right? They don't see that as their story. And you can't go to South Africa and not see that apartheid still exists, right? And how do you sort of engage a whole generation of people who are born free, who don't understand why the economic conditions of a country are the way that they are? Maybe this is one way to sort of do some of that work in a small way, right? Because they are digitally literate and can access the internet. So maybe there are ways to sort of bring that to them and, and work with them to sort of tell those stories in a way that is relevant to them, right? So they can begin to question, why is it that you know, the township still exists? Why is it that our infrastructure still exists in a way where we have to travel over half an hour to get from the townships into central Johannesburg? What does that sort of mean? What does that sort of say about you know, the sort of political, economic, and social structure that exists. I have a question about the technology. Yeah. So can you tell us a little, I've, I've done a lot with SketchUp, so that I know, but how hard is the transition from that into Unity? Because um, I've been toying with the idea of learning that during my sabbatical next year. <laughs> I teach a course on digital history, and I would love to be able to have my students leave, you know, doing that, having some experience in it. So how hard is it for a graduate student to pick it up it's not hard at all. Um, a colleague of mine that we how are build how how is the building model? I mean, do you pull it up like you do in yeah. SketchUp? Yeah, oh, it's, okay. it's very similar to to SketchUp. All of these um, 3D virtual softwares are pretty similar. Um, what's been interesting is um, a colleague of mine out of Arkansas, Allison Gill, who's a art historian, has actually worked with high school students to have them model um, buildings in their local towns. Um, and they've done some amazing work with very little sort of skill. What, what's fortunate about uh, both SketchUp and Blender, we, we use Blender uh, as one tool to sort of help build, and then we import those things okay. into Unity, and then we continue to sort of build them from there. So we sort of draft the models and then pull them into Unity, and then begin to sort of give yeah, them a better the resolution. Yeah. Could you do the yes, landscape? yes, you can do it. Um, I could show you some topography stuff. I mean, there's amazing right. sort of that's topography. The of is that you have this right, 3D right. No, um, it's completely robust in terms of being able to. What you can do is essentially import GIS data 
into um, Unity and begin to get these kind of contour maps working. So it's, 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 it's pretty amazing. Sorry, I got techie there. But the under, even working with your undergrads, you have no problem of them learning this? And you know, uh, one of the early courses I taught at Hamilton was called um, my E Black Studies course. And um, many of my students said, you know, I'm not really sure I like the internet. I don't trust it. I'm really, you know, I mean, it's been used. And, and um, as someone who teaches in Africana studies, you know, the, the kids of color tend to gravitate towards me and take my classes. They say, well, I'm not sure I want to do this, but all right, because you're teaching it, I'll take the class. <laughs> and at the end, they were all teaching each other how to use the technologies. You know, kids who, I mean, I literally had one young woman who went on to do graduate work at NYU say to me, oh, I really hate this stuff, but OK. Just because you say I should learn this, I will. And by the end of the semester, she was teaching the other students. You know, so the technology is there and sort of providing that gateway experience for students to sort of run with it and sort of teach themselves is totally possible. And I'm sure you've encountered that yourself. I had one, another kind of techie. It's more of a comment, I guess. I was trying to get it into question form. But I was thinking about what you were saying about, of course, just bandwidth, yeah. right? And then we're talking about infrastructure. We're not just talking about infrastructure in the sense of um, buildings. But then we're also talking about sort of technological infrastructures and even pipelines that get people to a place where they can interact with technology without our sort of mediation, without us in the middle, mm -hmm. right? Coming from, from the US, for instance. And I was wondering if you knew, because I've been really thinking about this and I don't have an answer, if there are any grants or sort of outlets for the development of hardware, yeah. I think hardware is, might be where it's at. Yeah. Instead of trying to sort of shoehorn sort of every place, and I mean place like different towns, different continents, different mm -hmm. countries, whatever degree you want to think about it, but really think about what it means to produce local hardwares mm -hmm. in the interest of producing these kinds of local scapes, these local kinds of, but is there any money for thinking there's some. Um, I think the Sloan Foundation and MacArthur would be very interested in some of that. What's um, troubling about some of this is that we know that much of the technology from the global north is being dumped in the global south. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but what isn't happening is the recycling of that technology in a way that could sort of take it um, into the new arena of being reused. Um, instead, it's being sort of mined for whatever sort of pieces and parts can be sort of recycled, but it's not being recycled in a way that could be used to create other technology, other hardware. So I think that is the critical gap that's there, that we probably need to find ways to sort of bridge, um, because there are mountains of this stuff. Right. Yeah. And yeah. how do we sort of do that? One, one way I would also argue is that Information schools, I schools, have really become very, very different places um, over the past handful of years and are very, very interested in the practical application of what to be able to do with hardware. So I think that there are some schools out there, Maryland being one, Illinois being another. Um, there, these kinds of discussions need to happen um, because I think there could be ways to sort of build some of this into those kind of graduate programs in terms of advocacy and sort of working older technology, older hardware to become new hardware mm -hmm. in ways. But again, that's a skills transfer. It's development and another kind of framework that needs to happen. But I think there are ways to sort of pair up with some of these. I mean, ideally working with an iSchool as a small liberal arts college, perhaps getting students as in a feeder kind of program to do graduate work you know, in an iSchool, um, develop some kind of relationship with an iSchool where we could begin to sort of develop these you know, summer programs where people could actually do some of this recovery work in terms of hardware. I think it's totally possible. But yes, I would also argue that hardware is, is perhaps the one thing we're not really thinking about. Even computer science programs. So sort of a critical pipeline. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So if there are any more questions, maybe we should stop there. That was so wonderful. Thank you so much.
Library for hosting us and thank you to Amherst Media also for recording. That was a very dense comp, so you'll have an opportunity to return to our website um, in the coming weeks and actually be able to listen to it again. So it's really has some time to assist and then we'll mark like it.